Well, this is a little preamble, I guess, what we're going to do here. Wrote, there, see wrote to Andrew, Andrew Lambert, so let's do a little cruise around here. Andrew, you can kind of tell us what we're looking at here now. That's the jam drum set. The jam drum set. And we track sometimes with that. This weekend, we're tracking with uh, Maurice O'Coin and Ian O'Donnell and uh, Craig Root. And Lee Fleming Smith, who I don't know yet, but I'm going to meet him. Beautiful oh. human being. He yeah. plays with me. You know what? Yeah, you're going you're to fucking love him. So, anyway, we're tracking live off the floor. Maurice got one or two blue songs. And uh, yes, I can separate everything. But we're kind of old school here in this little place that I, yeah. what I do. If you guys, if people want to play live off the floor, they come here or some people do. Right. right. And that's what we're going to do on the weekend. There's Sean. There's so this me. is this is your your main room. Tell us yeah. more about this. This is something that I'm interested in. That's a B, that's a real B3 organ and a Leslie in the car. Come on, let's see and it. Crank it open. I bought it from Andy Robichaud, the guy from I Love. I know yeah. Andy Robichaud very well. Yeah. And, uh, I have a friend that lives in Fine Heights, Rod MacArthur, who's a great guy. He put it all together for me. It's all working fine, but it's working even better now. And uh, so what you James and Ross Miller came here a couple years ago. We used this thing for. Some of the tracks. Lee uh, Fleming Smith is going to tear that to pieces. Yeah. So our, our Maurice said we're going to separate everything, but at the same time we're going to play live off the floor because we're probably going to get pretty good things. You that's know, that's you the list there. Yeah, that's Leslie. <laughs> Usually when I'm tracking <laughs> seriously, I put it in the uh. kitchen if it's a serious deal. But this we're just going to close mic everything, and then you, so that way you can turn it up and down if you get a real close mic on everything. How much is the way? They say they're over three hundred, but I, it doesn't feel like it's over three hundred. A lot. So be a triple what you're saying. What you are, I guess, Andrew. Is that what we're saying? I mean, when I get up to 100, it'll be <laughs> <That's right. everybody's laughs> good. Just take your wallet out and you lose weight. That's what I always say. Yeah. That so is. Anyway, so what year do you think that is? This is 74, and that's 64. Oh, and it cool. works like a baby. It works perfect. You know, I've been fortunate enough to have a close friend that's a maintenance guy on this thing. So right. Babies so we're we're pretty much amazed by how so cool this, this place is. This is a 140 year old hippie house. I've been here for about 15 years. And I work on upscale houses, most days in construction, and I do have no interest in turning this into a drywall house. Yeah, it's a, it's a cottage house. Yeah, we jam here Thursday nights with a bunch of local guys, and uh, every week consistently we do. And on the weekend, I'm quite busy with this track, and it's, uh, guys have even come here to rehearse. Is that I used right? to play with Campbell John, John Campbell John. I don't now, but. Uh, he and Neil Robinson would still come sometimes and rehearse here. So you're like the new Kenny Dwyer, is that what you're trying to say? But at the same time, you can come and jam in the evening and I can wake you off something on a CD and stick in a pair of driveways. Well, that's funny, Sean, I wrote here right now. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, that's right. I can sit down, mic you up, blah, 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 and put a CD in a pair of driveways. Okay, let's show us what's in here now. now. Booth, the only booth I have. X32, Garage of Four, a few things. See, it looks all old school out there. Then you get in here, a little different. A little different. Stuff that you can't really. So you're a Cubase guy, eh? Yeah. I love the place, Andrew. My old music man base. That's a piece of sort of maritime history. It belonged to Johnny Hand's brother, Owen Hand, in the 70s. And then Gus Morris, Zipper's brother, passed away, and I had bought it from him not long before he died. And uh, of course, Zipper's gone now. I had it since 1990. Two hundred bucks. Three fifty. <laughs> <laughs> at one point, I broke the trust rod. Oh, there. sorry. I sent one, it away. One fifty. We got it fixed. It's working. For so now, Scott cool. Harnish told me that you're, let's see if I get this right, your cousins with Todd Kearns, is that right? Yes. But I've never spoken to Todd, but I've spoken to my aunt, and yeah. my mother, and his are sisters. So my mother, my, my aunt will come down from Saskatoon. Okay. And she visit at our place. So they, my mother and her sister were both from Halifax, sort of like war brides. Her husband was a military guy. She married, went to the Saskatoon. My first cousin, Pat Burns, 
because Todd's mother. Okay. And my aunt would come down and say, Todd's got the hair this big if we talk a lot because I was playing all the time. So is he. Yeah. Have we ever actually spoke or reached out to each other? No, but I'm sure we could. So I rock, you're both playing bass, so too. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, uh, and his brother's bass player. That's all right. That's right. Yeah. He, was, uh, he was on the show a couple weeks ago and we mentioned it. And he was like, yeah, well, my mom's from Halifax, and I get cousins all over the place. So he, he didn't confirm or deny the connection. He was, he was very interesting. Oh, yeah. No, right. my, my aunt, Sufficient, would always come down and joke about their, what we would call it, new wave hair. Like that. In the 90s, they had the giant hair. Yep. That's right. Yeah. His brother, uh, John, plays with his face down around his knees. Yeah, I, that was the first band I saw in Toronto. I told them. So, Todd, you told us you were coming out here, brother. So, this way. You got a place to stay. Yeah, I should have visited him. Before, you know right? what? You love it. Here with Slash. I yeah. never went down. I could have said, hey, I'm your cousin. Well, and I, I do have to say, uh, for a guy that's done an awful lot, what a what a beautiful human being. He was, a, he was a great guy to talk to. Not an air of anything about him. Just uh, very humble. Um, and it was cool. But, uh, you know, he, it's funny. He, he remembered Halifax and he said, I probably get a ton of cousins around here. And he said he wants to come back. Uh, just we'd love guy. to have you, brother. We'd love to have you. Okay, let's sit, let's sit down, Andrew. Let's go for some more. Now we got the. We, get, we don't usually do things like this. This is kind of an impromptu. Yeah, this, is this is a real. This is keep it real. It's like a hippie house. This is like a hippie interview. So there you go. So you sit there. Okay. Okay. So what we're gonna do? Let's just see what happens. But put the camera like that. Okay. Here we go. Let's see, Andrew. All right, so the first question I'll ask, so we're, we're sitting here, and uh, you get my big head in there, my big McKenna head. Uh, so uh, the first question I'll ask, you talked about, uh, you know, you've done a lot of tracks and done, done a lot of things. Who are some of the uh, the folks that you've you recorded here? John Campbell John, it's good to go out. Dan Dewari, I can never pronounce his name. Sorry, Dan. I did most of his album here. A lot of time I just track drums, some of the other instruments, guitar, bass, keyboards, guys take it home. And I actually prefer that because to sit down with someone and mix can be a hair pulling out experience. Mm -hmm. I have no hair, but it's not much fun. It's easier today. If you guys do something, I'll give you the wave files, take them home, you play for hours, play for years if you want. Yep. Like, cause I can mix as fast as I want or you can mix as fast as you want. And it's a real bog down effect. And people tend to disagree so it, it all works fine but i really like just tracking it ross builder got me to do an evie anderson album a few years back he called me up and you can do track it which basically meant track it he doesn't care what mic i use he doesn't care anything mm. just give me the tracks i think i know that you know what you're doing and uh, it was successful he was happy with the tracks right on. and they take them and ross did a wonderful job mixing mastering stuff like that so really i don't do I don't try to delve too much into any kind of mastering because I'm not going to waste someone's time on that. Learning. Sure. But you've done but I know full how projects to track. here, right? I've done full projects right to the, yeah. to the end. But what I'm saying is I prefer, I call Ross my go-to man the few times I've used him. I mix it. I give it to him. He masters it. He puts it in order. He does this. He gives the guys perfect. It goes off. It's printed. I prefer that. But my forte here is live off the floor track. Right. And I do overdubs. Mm -hmm. But I, my forte is that. And that's that's what I'm. Doing. I'm going to presume the acoustics in this room must be incredible. That's fantastic. Because it's it's this, it's the okay. coolest thing. If you can look around, we kind of I'll maybe do another shot on the way up because it, it's just door. I don't know what the hell that is. Looks like a, 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 a table. I can tell you what that is briefly. There's a whole bunch of card letters in there. They're all pre 1900. Really? Many, many years ago, I worked at King's College with my ex brother in law was a contractor. They had a room full of junk, and they said, "Take the junk out." As for throwing the junk out to renovate it this comes out it's a tabletop it's all curved with these notable names from nova scotia like what names uh, joe howe oh, I mean, not, not, not joe howe but the howe name okay there's uh rutherford's anyway the reason i know they're important names because a friend of mine his wife uh alan hollett his wife's name is darlene hollett mm -hmm. she works at the archives forever she came here and looked at that and said they're all significant names to sell to him. doctors lawyers right. not my ancestors but they were guys that went to Dalhousie's King's College 150 years ago. Wow. If we took a flashlight and went over that, you'd see that every date is pre-1900. So we were all boys one time. Remember when you had a jackknife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone whittled those 
his names went all over that. Like Incredible. It's full of names. Incredible. So when it was leaving King's College, I said, I'm taking it home. And I stuck it up there. And in a weird way, it works with the acoustics. Too. But I had I didn't have enough wall space to put it on. Okay. Well, it was what? a good spot. I mean, I came in and I thumped the kick drum. And even the kick drum. Kick drums can be really, really hard to get a good sound the best of times because they can be lively. Yeah. That sounded very snappy for, uh, I'm guessing that's a 22 yeah. by about uh, a 20, 22 by yeah. 20 -ish. Yeah. 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 Uh, it does sound good in here, not because I own the place, but for some strange reason it does. And uh, when I track, I got a six chan channel headphone amp over there. And with the board, of course, I get discrete mixes. So if it's something important, I put a guitar amp in the porch, I put the other guitar amp there, I put a Leslie in the kitchen, you know, and uh, the drums are essentially the only thing live in the room. But I do, I'm a fan of close mic mm -hmm. in that. Some guys, they do this ambient thing, and it does work, and Led Zeppelin did it. So you have some overhead stuff too, right? I know, but Led Zeppelin did all that stuff 50 years ago, and some local guys say, put one mic over it, that sounds good. That's fine, but if you're trying to mix something down and you don't have the hi hats, yeah. and you're four weeks into something, it's much easier to go, there it is. Yeah. Yep. So at least you can bring in the presence. Right. Right. So it, I've done stuff where guys have mic with one big mic, and it sounds good, but you can't turn the drums up or down. If, no. if the guy's not a good player that makes them sound right on his own, you have a real grand problem. I'm talking to mix of the balance. Yep. That's just an opinion. Oh, my opinion that's that's what's to happened to me with my recording career. Mm. No. No, when I <laughs> used to do a lot of live sound and uh, for some Bernie Swiley. Yep. Do some for Bernie Swiley and Milo Thomas and things like that. And I always say, Bernie, give me a hi-hat mic. And sometimes they wouldn't have it there. And I'd say, I always want one or I want this. I want a close mic because he has this giant PA. And there's nothing worse than not being able to at least turn something up. You can complain about the tone about it, but if mm -hmm. you don't have it, yeah, yeah. and there's a room full of people, you got to have the drums close mic. That's yeah. all. You can't put two mics up and say that's all you need. That's all you need. It might work in a blues band at a yep. low volume, but when you really want directness, it's my favorite. Band. So it's interesting. So you, 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 you always hear about you know people going to these studios at the. You know the main room is thirty two hundred square feet, and there's sound pads all over the place. Yeah, this is this is literally like I'm looking around. You've got a lot of vintage stuff, right? Yeah. You, and I, I'm assuming you record it with non vintage stuff, more we'll call it like more, you know, modern yeah. equipment. Yeah. What's your what's your preference? My preference is I won't say vintage. It's because kind of in the middle. It's the instruments are very important. The tone of the player is important, which you guys know. Yeah. yeah. Every done live sound. There's yeah. guys that just walk up and they sound good. Yeah. yeah. So I, said, I played with guys that had these big space gadgets and they, they I don't like sounds at home and you go up and we used to say the Grand Canyon. Three of us are over here. You're on the other side of the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And nothing could bring presence into the PA with that guy. Yeah. So sound is, is, is uh, that starts with the instrument or the guy or whatever. Sure. Like you said, that you like that drum. I got a couple of basses that I think sound pretty good. And I've had guys come in with their own bass and it sounds pretty good. But I, I might plug in one of mine or recommend it. Now, oddly enough, when it all comes down, it sounds pretty good. But well, if the instrument's very cool. And here's what I like, because I, uh, not necessarily live, but in the studio, I've always been a big proponent of bring in, if you've got, you know, one Tom that's a Yamaha, one Tom that's yeah. a Tam, I kicked him. That's what you have. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and I'm going like, that's exactly what I would do when I would go, like, I've recorded yeah. where I bring in a snare that's not even mine, but I like the sound. And maybe it's a Yamaha snare. Um, a different tom from a different kit and you figure it in your hodgepodge and somebody looks at it and goes well this looks like crap you know what i'm not playing live with it i don't have to worry about looking cool i want to sound yeah. and i'm going to sound cool and that to me is like i i you know i'm a big believer in what i'm seeing right there that it's bass just, drum was a funny thing I mean, go ahead uh, i walk into music stop with neil robertson the tall guy from awesome lefty from, yeah shuffle from, shuffle guy from he hell in my little cottage back here yeah we went into music stop one day for something and this kid pulls out He's literally taking the bass drum out of the box and he goes, you guys want this bass drum? I said, no, really? I'm a bass player. And he said, give me 200 bucks plus tax. You can have that bass drum. Someone ordered it in. It was a real expensive one. And Neil says, hey, man, that's that's a really good bass drum because it was deep. And big. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? When we're jamming, very seldom do we ever say this. That is a good bass drum. Because what you're a drummer, but you're sitting out here. Yep. Normally a bass drum a bass drum. You treat yep. it with the PA and it gives a good thumb. That thing, for some strange reason, I don't know why. Sounds good. The well, drum itself does. And here's the thing. And I'm a Bapex guy. I ever split I'm a Bapex guy. Right? I'm a, like, I've owned bits and pieces of Mapex. I had snares. I've had pedals. First kit I had, I was lucky that 
Mapex took care of me, but Mapex are great sounding drums that I think fly bro the was the right yeah. yeah I, know. I don't even know if that's what what uh, great that is is it expensive or not it's just a great, it, it you know what good. here's the thing I personally subscribe to the Eddie Van Halen school of if it sounds good it is good yeah I've had drums that are three thousand dollar kick drums that sound like absolute dog crap and then I've had you know the acme kit that you know is three point you put a head on it and a little bit of foam rubber and it sounds amazing I've right so mics that, uh, you know uh, i i can't say for sure but right to the end you see a huge stadium concert and when they focus around the drummer you go right down the snares 57. yep so i'm thinking like in this giant Jesus. world in this giant world of all they could pick they're playing for a hundred thousand people yeah. and the sound guy picks a 57. it's not that it's the best drum but it's got the right sound. I will Gary, say, I I'm a 57 guy. killer, though. I'm a 57 Gary, killer. Gary, that freaking little bucket kit has a nice little bass drum yeah. sound. Like, so you, you never know, right? You just never really know. You, you just plays downtown busking, and it's, it's, a little, it's a bucket, but it's like, it's got a nice little yeah. staff to it. Yeah, I've seen that whole thing. Crazy. And the so, player is very powerful. But uh, you know what? I've heard of this place here, I think, and you know what? When Leith gets over here, he'll eat this place oh, up. Know, Leith is an old soul, and I'm telling you right now, that I love the vibe that's in this room. Right now, like, I'm sitting there, stuck. Like, I'm almost vibrating because just the you know, carpet and it's just the wood floor. I know why it sounds good because it's in a good spot. You know, that's what I feel, right? It's Personally. a good jam spot. Yeah, recently yeah. I bought, I had a bunch of full ranges that were kind of mixed and recently I got four of these little Mackies and I got, it's all, I can, I can operate with my iPad so I can make the vocals fit and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, I only put vocals in on the jam, but it sounds right. Before I had a bunch of different odd speakers mm -hmm. power amps and i'm just tweaking and eq and this and that yep. now it's like i can put you over there and the sounds the same yep. they're all balanced yeah and i just use all 58s in the jam and so they all feedback the same yep you know, so so i'll throw something out there and it's yeah. funny dave and i the last week or more uh and i won't name names or throw stones but dave and i've had conversations about the whole pretentious side of music where you know <laughs> if you're not schooled or you're not um learned uh, um you know you Aren't, aren't able to, you know, and I'm, I'm using air quotes, not able to hold conversations with certain people. I walk in here and I go, man, not this is a place. Not yours. 100%. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out because you know what, uh, struggle with that all the time. But I, I walk in here and I go, this is a place I would love to record. Yeah. Okay. I'm sitting here by the wood stove. It's true. Right. And that, how old is that fucking wood stove? I don't know. I'm telling you, it's, it's, is the detail it's everything about this place and I'm telling you, it's just got a really, it's really got a vibe. Look, I'm sitting yeah. here, it reminds me of like, uh, like a leave on helm type, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're in a. I didn't do it a... intentionally, but it's, it's. I know it's developed. It's grown into something. But, yeah. So here's my question: Have you know. had people that have come in here yeah. and go, "Well, geez, they're not getting it. They're not getting the vibe. They're not getting the acoustics." And they go like, "Ah, well, you know." And they start giving you a couple about the fact that they don't think they're in a real studio. No. no. When you're playing with the right people, no, I never and you're recording, I don't, I don't advertise at all. I don't have. I don't care to advertise. Yeah. Because Dan Tuori, he told me that he had a little studio in Toronto. This is, this, I can say it the quick sense. He'd come home on Friday after rushing home. There'd be four kids with Marshall Amps waiting in the driveway. Yeah. I don't even want anybody to come here until they come over and hang out. And I say, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. I'm not, I don't try to get involved with producing anybody. Right. This is just how I do it. If you like it, it's fine. Yeah. If you don't go somewhere yeah. else, yeah. If you want to bring your Marshall Amps in and turn them up and SVTs and blah, blah, blah. That's all fine. But I can't operate in that world. That's all. That's, you know what I mean? But I do, not, I don't mind when guys bring in their drum sets as long as they don't suck. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, because that helps. I'm all about sucking, Andrew, so we'll have to use that drum kit there. But no, and all joking aside, I mean, it's, it's just, I, you know, we keep saying it. There's just a vibe. Like I'm sitting here and it's like, I, 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 well, can't I, get, I, get, I can take a look for one little walk. Here's some stuff I'm picking up on. Now, how old is this phone? Like, this is the old party line phone, is it not? That's, uh, she called Todd on that one. <laughs> for the ring. No, I don't know how old that is, but I'm a bit of a collector. As I love see. it, man. I love it. And that, that, that's, with the old blacksmith stuff. That's uh, from a pony. Jeez. This is something I got recently, which is odd. It's a, there's a sickle, for God's sake. Creepy at the same time. Ooh, wow. I do Renos and I was in a house. Is it a gun? Down the basement. It's a gun. Like, what's the history that's of like, that? That's a World War II. It's a World War II. I've yeah. seen the, it's a one shot job. I can't remember the model, yeah. but. Uh, wow. Anyway, okay. it and then, hey, remember, did it rot in a hole or did it rot in someone's crawl space? Who knows? Right? Yeah. Interesting. And there's a gun up there, another one. This one. See what Sam's ordering? Oh, yes. I found that in the shed. Oh, my Jesus. I'll tell you what I like because I was very studious. Yes. He's got the giant pencil sharp. Oh, yeah. Dave James. Ah. Got Dave, Dave James, the drummer. Yep. One of the best. He gave me that. He said, Did you he? have to keep your pencil sharp. 
Right on. Yeah, because he was a he could write charts as fast as hell with a pencil, old school. <laughs> nice to meet you, Sansa. Let's get a light on that. Let me see. I don't have much of a Oh my God. Look, so look, T. Rutherford, 1878. Oh my God. And he's on here a couple times. These guys were good whittlers too, eh? I can't quite figure out if it was a shop. So. I don't think it was a shop table, but they sat there every day and whittled these names. Oh my God. They're, they're all over it. And the dates are all pre 9 Blows me away. I, I print when I write with a pen and I'm, I'm looking at this. I'd like to have one of those. Remember your kids, you put a paper on, you etched them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is amazing. It is amazing, yeah. So come on here for a second. Sure. So yeah. this is what he's talking about. So he roll the roll. I roll the Leslie out here. I put the door on and we turn it up. So right. when Ross and Ian were here, uh, this is they just cool. I'm just Let saying. Come down or come up. Everyone should have a pump organ in their kitchen. Yeah. They should. <laughs> I got that from. Uh, I used to go to Lisa Manuel's sister, Kirsty, for a long time. Her younger sister and her uncle had left that in her apartment. And, uh, one day they were cleaning the house. And you got to take this over. So I took it home. Yeah, I'm just saying. There's a lot of of stuff. There's a pantry there that I put guitar amps in, usually. <laughs> all, all these beams and things I put in because the house was like that when I first came in here. Well, it helps that you that, that's your background, so you can yeah. crank it up and level it this off. It's cool, like do that. It's just so cool. So yeah, I kind of get John Foster, that's from Norway. My first trip overseas was with John to Norway. Wow. And uh, Norway was a lot like a big move Is that right? We landed in the airport. There's one small building. I'll never forget it. In the middle of nowhere. It seemed like the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and there's other bands converging. <laughs> so when we were texting, it yeah. was really funny. We always talk about how how small our little community is. You said to me, uh, Steve Harnish says hi. Yeah, yeah. And um, 19, actually, Steve left the band that I was in, in I won't date myself, but yeah. to go play with John Campbell, John. Yeah. And uh, stay with him for a while. Yes, he did. Yeah. So, um, Probably a good segue into the amount of uh, talent that's out here in the Herring Cove, Spryfield area. Yeah, I played with a lot of guys from out here and know them a lot. They're very talented. So what, what do you think? What do you think? There's so much talent out here. I don't know. I, I used to say it was an area, but I might disagree with your point because I found that there's high level musicians everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. People say, oh, okay, Breton, they say here. If you study neighborhoods, you'll find out that. You know, in Spryfield, there was Jackie Harris and Danny Eiston and Bill Wallingham. These are friends of mine that have all passed on. Richie Oakley. Yeah, right. You could throw a rock from each one of these guys' houses and hit the other. And how they ever got so good, I don't know. They didn't have YouTube. Jimmy White was another one. Yeah. These guys could play like absolute, per like they went to school to, to learn how to play. You know, their, their knowledge was high level knowledge, as well as being wonderful players. Have you ever heard Jackie Harris, the guy from Southern? Yeah, right. 100%. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. We were, we were with Pam Marshall on uh, Sunday, and uh, Pam was talking about uh, the last gig that she played was about three and a half, four years okay. ago. And Jack was, was playing with her. Yeah. Um, Probably Zipper, bass player. Tony I believe Morris, so, yes. Morris. It was a benefit Luke's for somebody. You must know Luke. Yeah, Luke. Luke Morris. Luke Morris. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Played with so yeah. 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 So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's funny that, you know, yeah, you are right, because, I mean, we grew up in Dartmouth. And um, Dartmouth has a fair share of good musicians. And I think that, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned YouTube. I mean, we've had, we've talked before about, you know, in our era, we had to turn the, the vinyl record down to 16 RPM to figure out sometimes what the heck somebody was doing. <laughs> now you can go on a YouTube and see a four year old doing Tom Sawyer. It just blows yeah. your mind, right? Uh, it's a big, it was a big step for me when I got the turntable with a speed controller. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. I, I did that. So we stick quarters on the arm so it slows her down. <laughs> right? I forgot about that. You know, I mean, the kids today, they're not, it's true. They're not any lazier or, or more ambitious than us. But I know the guys, that, you know, some of those guys I just mentioned, they, they took gear from one host to the other guys, teenagers with wheelbarrows, which was oh, the fuck. fuck. Yeah. Well, I never did that. I, 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 I remember jamming yeah. with guys out here living in Dartmouth, get on that bus and get on the old 11 bus and come, come, come across and, you know, music with my. My little Fitzwa Marshall amp, my gear. I'm trying to take die that call. That's fine. That's all right, brother. Send me live TV. Um, 
you know, and the other thing too that's interesting is that um, you know the YouTubers. Somebody pointed out something to me that I, I thought was interesting. They know the notes. They're pointing the notes like mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah, I know you're four. It's all great. But a lot of them now are the what they're missing is the heart, the soul, the actual what what mu- like. It's not that they're no good. They're obviously very good. You see, yeah. some of these kids are just crazy good. But the one piece that they're missing is maybe that kind of feeling of you know why yeah why you play the tune why, what it's yeah. all about. Yeah, uh, we put so many our generation the amount of night that we spent in the basement and going away to make fifty bucks and coming home with nothing. Yeah, and freezing cars and changing yeah. tires and all that. I'm not saying that all matters, but it it deepens something. It deepens you, right? its character, right? And, and I mean. And they're all going to have to experience that too. Yeah. But unfortunately, I was very, I mean, fortunately, I was very lucky all through my 20s, 30s, and 40s. I played all the time. Yeah. I played with Sam and Sam Dangle, the country rock band. Mm-hmm. We would play 40 weekends plus. Right. Weekends. Yeah. We never left town. It was spoiled, absolutely spoiled. Well, your weekend on the Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday and Matinee. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I have no secrets. They were basically 100 bucks each time. So, not being a doctor or lawyer, I could pull off 400 bucks a week on top of my pay every friggin' week. Yep. And yep. the guys that were doing seven nights a week do the math. You yep. know, the guys that were uh, like Ross Builder, for instance, running around town all the time doing multiple, multiple gigs. He, he would work a lot harder, but maybe make a little bit more than that, yep. you know. But uh, we were spoiled. And those days are over now. Kids talk about doing one night and now it turns into one set. Yep. So, yep. But it's a whole other world. I, I can't say it's bad. I can't say it's good. Yep. It's just a fact. Yep. Well, I mean, you know, the other thing too, when we first started this, one of the things that was, uh, you know, was apparent was the amount of clubs that aren't around anymore. Like yeah. Dartmouth, I think Dave counted close to twenty-eight clubs. Yeah, so you could have right. played. You could have played. You could have played Sackville for you know the better part. I would play the Corral in Sackville with yeah. Sam. And uh, yeah, JB's. My son's place, JB's. Yeah. We played Little Nashville. Yep. Yeah. Versions of that, and uh, downtown Halifax. But I hated downtown Halifax. You're gonna laugh. No part. No part. Yeah, well, that has changed, but I see uh, myself if I do if I do a good shirt or whatever, pull up the cheers and pull in. Most of the time, I play up the Ar- armadillo, right? The right, country band. yeah. So I get my stuff in, not my amp because uh, that's another story, but I get up there, I run in, and I have to park my car. Sometimes I run way down by Stainers, yeah, I walk all the way up. Yeah. And you know how cold that part of town is, 100%. Hours? And yeah. you know, and it's funny, and, and that's the one thing about you know the parking. The other thing that comes up a lot, um when everything was locked down and people couldn't go out, um, you know, there was this recurring thing that uh, some people don't work musicians get to kind of feel what musicians felt like learning how to play, where we spent an awful lot of time in our bedroom and our basement. Yeah. Yeah. Fly ourselves trying to get good at what we were doing. Yeah. Um, now it's starting to open up a little bit. Um, have you been doing any playing since it, uh, since it started or since it started to open up? Not really, just jamming. We have yeah. our Thursday night band. We've got a couple benefits with that for some guys that passed away. I so who's know. in that band? Uh, Roy Dempsey, one of my neighbors, Steve Hardis. Okay. Uh, Mike Lishitz, he's a guy who plays drums with Sam now. Yep, currently. Yep. Uh, Alan Hollett, that's a good friend of mine from Sprite Hill, a very good guitar player, went to Humber College, and uh, Russell Tenor. And believe it or not, I play organ, which I shouldn't say on keyboard, on, online, but I do. And uh, compared to some of my buddies, yeah, yeah. just a beginner. But I figure if you start something, you'll creep. That's right. It anyway. yeah. I got it when I was 50, I'm 56 now. I think by the time I'm 60. I'll be better. There it is. And, well, I, and we jam consistently every Thursday night, which sounds really corny, but I'll say it in the camera. I lost so many musician friends, older ones. Yeah. And if we don't get together on Thursday night, yeah. good or bad, we're wasting our time. It's not fair to them. And you, you know, know what? I tell you, that, guy I, last year, he called me. He said, I'm, I'm going to go. So what's going on? I got bad cancer right there. I got a couple of weeks. He was gone in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. He was walking around the yard, normal. And nope, inoperable. You know, it's sad for me, man. I, uh, and I won't name names, but a, a number of years ago, a friend of mine was like, we got to go visit this guy who plays bass with this band. And I'm like, and I knew the guy and I'm thinking, wow, that's going to be really cool. Go down to this crummy one bedroom apartment on Roby street. And I walk in and the door's kind of falling off and I'm going, this man played his entire life yeah. and God love him. He might be happy, but the, the, the pension plan for a musician mm-hmm. is pretty crappy. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. And that's why, um, you know, when everything gets shut down, people didn't realize, you know, if, if people view music, it's fun and it's, it's a living for people. And when you're not making any money, it's a tough going. They don't understand that. Right. I know. And I, myself have tried to shape sense into some of the, I saw it happen with, when I was about 40, some of my friends that were 50 
these guys that had done it all their life, all of a sudden they had no identity. And again, I won't say any names. Yeah. But if I called them and said, I'm building a deck, can you come and help me and make a couple hundred bucks? Oh, man, I don't know. It's yeah. like, shit or get off the park. Yeah. So I'm sorry that in this little world we live in, you have to do it. I, I saw one of the guys, I think it was a drummer for Pearl Jam, said he was painting a house for one of the guys from Guns N' Roses. That was, that and was, then, a, the that's my, oh my God. The guy yeah, that's and my said, favorite scene. What are you doing? I'm painting your house, man. Well, last week we were playing at a, last year we were playing at a festival for 50,000 people. Yeah. Well, that's the reality of it. Yeah. That's my favorite scene at Hired Gun, yeah. where it's Matt Soren from Guns N' Roses, right. and he says to the guy, he's a drummer from Three Doors Down. Oh, yeah. And he said, Matt says, how's it going? How do you think it's going? I'm painting your house, man. You know what I mean? And it's like, but God I love them because there's an awful lot of musicians that wouldn't do that. You know, they want to play for the crowd. They, you know, and you know what I mean? And I, I don't want to, again, I'm not, I don't want to dump on anybody. It's all about work ethic. And it's your yes. choice to have that type yes. of work ethic. It's your choice. Uh, am I judging them? Maybe I am. But I'm really, all I'm saying is that if someone calls me, I'm not going to go to work for now. Yep. I'll play a benefit for now. Yep. I'll crawl across. I'll, you know, I'll spend $100 to play a benefit. Sure. I have. But. I don't like doing gigs for nothing. Absolutely right. nothing. You know what I'm saying? So, well, but at, but at, at the same time, I never turned down work. Years ago, I was really in the country rock scene, and I played all the time. And every now and then, someone would say, "Do you want a gig?" And I'd consult one of my other bass players. Unfortunately, one of my friends had passed. Hey, man, you know this gig? And it was Louisa's, I think, at the time. Yeah, she was playing forty weekends. He was looking out the window of a bar, you know, where they put the food up. Yep. He was cooking in the kitchen. And I said, hey, man, you make more doing that. No, man, I can't fight country. <laughs> and, I, and at that time, I thought to myself, "Yeah, you just started this job. It's a dead-end job. You're putting up plates of food. And at the time, it was actually a lucrative thing. You were going to play 40 weekends because Louisa played all the time. Yeah. And it would have been a three or $500 week for him. Yeah. Instead, he was cooking at the tavern all the time. So, but am I any, it's bad for me to judge it. But at the same time, I said, to me, it was easy now. Yeah. And I would have taken the job. Well, and it's funny, right? There's recurring themes of this old world show. And one of them was about the work ethic. And some people have it and some people don't. And, you know, Dave and I talk about this a lot. I'll go out to a show. And if I'm sitting in the crowd drinking a beer, yeah. whether I like you or not, yeah. you know, I might tell Dave on the way home. Wink, yeah. wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be polite. And I'm going to tell you that you're great. And I expect the same thing when I'm playing. Yeah, yeah. And you're probably the same way. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses. Yeah. Um, I, I like to use the Keith Moon thing. There's no better Sean McKenna drummer than Sean McKenna. Right. There's no better Andrew Lambert yeah. bass player than Andrew Lambert yeah. or Dave McPherson, yeah. right? So, you know, what you're talking about the work ethic, it also comes down to commitment. It comes down to, I guess, a little bit of integrity. And it comes down to honing your craft. Yeah. Bruce Dixon, my buddy, you know, one of the best. He, uh, for years, played seven nights at Cheers. Got up in the morning, did a day job, eight hours. Right. Yeah. I'd see him, you know, and there he was going. Yeah. And we both did that. I had a little bit more flexibility because I did construction. I'd be working with my friends often, and I could say, I'm not coming in Friday because I'm playing until four in the morning. I'm going to national. So I would choose not to go in. But other guys didn't have a choice because yeah. I had a job that would give them no time off. Yep. Yeah. And they had to play all the same gigs for 40 weekends. Gordy Thomas and those guys. Some of them had jobs like that. But if they're going to stay in town, because that's the other part of it. You, know, you go back 30 years ago, you didn't have to stay. And you there's a lot more money to be made yes. when you're always done in Halifax. Let's be real freaking honest, especially yeah. if you're doing the Newfoundland route. No one really liked it, but the money was a whole lot better. Yes. Now, if you were going to do the, the, the northern New Brunswick or the yeah. Quebec Peninsula, whatever, there's a lot more money to be made. So, yeah, yeah, more risk, you know, probably more reward. Yeah. Get all the way up to Toronto like Sean did, it's like, you know, and then give him your best shot with the recording contract and see how that, if that's what you want to yeah. do. If you just want to play, then you're right. It's like if you're watching this diminishing scope, you can't just play in Halifax no. for a living. You know what I mean? No. You can't. Right? And uh, you could be involved in music for a living. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, like I said, I was a live sound guy a lot, only because I wasn't playing. And I don't know, I'm giving myself a compliment. I never got in trouble. So I guess I'm saying that I survived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. was sound man for Wayne. You know, you know. Yep. And I never got, hey, that, don't ever hire that guy. I yep. never got that. Yep. Okay. It was always doing a good job. Bernie Smiley would call me in and I do the melatones right off the bat, which were kind of, you know, they were not happening in advance, but he knew I could survive. Yeah. And I wasn't going to get thrown off the stage. Yep. And I knew what to do. Walk up to the guy's monitor, stick your head in it. Doesn't matter if the band's playing. 
yeah. you got to walk around the stage and you got to know those old tricks. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting you, you mention to. that. You, you have to. Yeah. It's interesting you mention that because as far as sound check drummers go, uh, I am probably the worst one out there. Now, yeah. um, I just, I don't, and it comes from playing a lot <laughs> of places where people were eating lunch or dinner and you had the sound check and you didn't want to be intrusive and whatever. So I just kind of drew that. It's not a phobia. I just, I want it over with. I want it done. So what it would do, my gear would be ready to go. You know what I mean? And it'd be like, if I'm hitting that kick drum, two thuds, we're not frigging around that we got the That's whole thing too. ready to go. Line check, they would call that. Yeah, right. yeah. exactly. Years but ago. you bring up a big, good point about the, the sound thing. Yeah. You know, I know if somebody says, yeah, Andrew Lambert's going to mix and I'll go, okay. Versus blah, 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 it's going to mix and I'm going to. Yeah. And it's Zach, because they work yes, with no we're, we're big fans of Zach. Zach, Zach is yeah. Here's the yeah. thing about Zach. Young kid, yeah. always prepared. Yeah. He's a drummer, so I know I'm going to sound fantastic. Yeah. He's um, an old soul, too. He, he is? See, yeah. Yeah, and he's just, look, I was hauled off truck like, years ago. Donnie Muir, the keyboard player, yeah. told me, there's good guys and bad guys. You'll meet these high-level guys. Some of them are, hey, Andy, how you doing, man? Sounds good. Jackie Harris was always like that. That's great bass playing. It was wicked. You met other guys from the same circle of friends. They were... They didn't it seem like they didn't like it. Yeah. Okay. You guys encountered this too. Oh, yeah. You'll meet people all the time. All the time. Yeah. For some I would encounter reason, when we get up to the stop. They don't see the light. I mean, it's just it's a it's an animal thing. You feel it as soon as you go in the room. You go, know, some strange reason. It could be a peer, it could be just another guy. For some reason that guy doesn't like it. Yeah. And with Donnie and Richie Oakley, I played with him for years, and Sam. We were good old boys, man. We got in the truck and when the tire broke down, Richie began at the truck with the grease up our arms. And it was like a brotherhood. Yeah. Well, we had Sam. You know, there, was no, there was no, there was none of this. Uh, I'm not going under there. Let me go under. Sam had and the I funniest had story. Like he had the funniest story because we talked a little bit about with Bruce Dixon too about the whole yeah. the boys used to party back and. He did. And he, you know, Sam's like, yeah, Richie used to say all the time, if you can't play drunk, you can't play. <laughs> he was so funny, that guy, Richie. It was unbelievable. Yeah. The com the comedy we had, but yeah. sitting in the car and going away with them. Um, I played with him from about 1998 to almost till Richie passed. And, but I had to leave Sam's band because I was playing with Campbell John. And after a while, I was seven out seven out of ten. Yeah. Once you start going all the time, that's the sign. I said, Sam, I can't commit. I hate to do it. And Carson just playing. With him. And I've subbed for Carson since then. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, you, you find that uh, driving in the car with these guys, you hear stories. It was just like a movie. You know, yeah. Sitting, listening, and it. It was a time capsule. You sure it was. Yeah. And, but so some people wouldn't be important, but they talk about Dutchie. They talk about right. know, their own stuff. Well, it's so funny. We were coming up, we were playing the bars, and we heard the stories, and we were almost trying to outdo them. And it was just really childish and juvenile. It was almost like the yeah. Dennis uh, Dennis Miller skit where he talked about Izzy Straddling got fired from Guns N' Roses. What the hell do you got to do to get fired from <laughs> Guns N' Roses, right? But it was the same thing. I remember coming up and it was like, oh, well, let's drink a beer on stage and act. It was just dumb, stupid, juvenile stuff. But those guys were actually pros at act. And, I, and listen, I'm not meaning to sound callous. Yeah. It's a skill set. Okay. If you're, you're playing bars and, and to play with a few in you, yeah. sometimes gives the music a, a neat feel too. Oh, and if yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. And I play with brilliant people. That can't drink, fall off the stage. Yeah. And Richie Oakley, Bruce Dixon would tell you this, dog would tell you this. They, he never fell off the stage. Yeah. When he drank. Yeah. But he drank till he was old 50 and quit. And uh, that's when I started playing with him. But I mean, he was the nicest guy on the planet. Yeah. When he was young, the alcohol would get him in trouble. But he never had a mean bone in his body. He would be in fights all the time, he told me. But other people would start them. Right. And because he grew up tough, he, he could fight. Yeah. And he said, geez, I was saving my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The strangest thing. Yeah. 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 Let's do some more name dropping. So tell me who else you have worked with recording wise. Is that your main staple gig? Or would you say you're a player? Like, what's I your main? I've played for years. That's all I ever did. But so, like, what are you doing these days? These days, I'm preparing to do this thing with Maurice. Okay. The COVID knocked the hell out of everything. Sure yeah. did. But the year before that, I did a CD with Gordy, Doug, uh, Gordy Thomas, mm -hmm. Gordy Duggan, the country guy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, E.B. Anderson mm -hmm. and the Resolutes, Dan Dwarian, and uh, geez, Mike Oliver, the jazz blues guy. I don't know if you know him at all. I know who he is. Mike's got a big band with like, eight people. We, did, we, never, we never released it, but we did a whole bunch of track in here. You know, Paul Harris, the keyboard player, mm -hmm. Dave James, and the three piece horn section. And essentially, that was it until this kind of died out. You know? Yeah. A few weekends ago, I did uh, some tracks for Branded Men. You know, the guys are doing the. Uh, 
Merle Hager tribute. Mm. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Just a little bit of tracking, but nothing. You know, I don't think they're going to do it. But mm. the track them, so. That's about where it is right now. Now, if you're playing, yeah. like so who were you last playing with? It. My last gig would have been Dan Gordon. Okay. We went down to Memphis. We won that Blues Challenge. Okay. And went down there with Ross Billard and Mike Carroll. Nice. We stayed there for four or five days and nice. uh, got to see some cool stuff. And got to play in a you know a small fish in a big pond. Yeah. It was a cool place, very tourist like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned Carson. I get a text from Carson the other day. I want my goddamn mug. It's pretty much. What oh, that's what. Oh, that's what. Yeah, he yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, I, want my, I want my goddamn mug. He's, he's, he goes, I'm in Jarvis. He's like, I'm looking for a meet. He's like, oh, sorry, man, I'm at work. Yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, we got traffic from the Sean day. He's like, I didn't see us. I didn't know. Yeah, you can't promise there. Carson Richards anything because he comes looking for it. So anyway, yeah. Um, where's my base on this guy in show business? Yeah, oh my God, what a what a sweetheart. What a sweetheart. sweetheart. I haven't seen your dance moves yet, though, Andy. I don't know. No, no, my God. So when you uh, when you do recording what's that when you say there's good guys in Vancouver yeah Carson's one of them. Oh, the question so we haven't actually laid eyes on the man face to face it just hasn't happened yet oh, yeah. uh we talked to him a month and a half two months ago yeah. yep and uh yeah what a what a what a sweetheart for sure uh plays with a friend of ours uh Michelle Ryder that oh, yeah, Michelle, we're doing yeah. a, doing a, another little gig with good. um when you do a project, yes. is it kind of on a case by case basis in terms of what you charge and how you do it, or do you have your set? It's many different or... ways. I won't put a figure on it, but I, I'll, I'll analyze it. Okay. You guys come up with your own band. Yeah. I'll give you a dollar figure for each guy. Okay. What that means is so if it was a $200 time, yeah. whatever time limit that is, I'm saying random, there's four guys in the band, that's 50 bucks each. Yeah. Okay, so that's how you break it down, and it's easier for guys to handle it, yeah. handle it financially sure. too. Meaning, yeah, yeah. like if you guys came out, we'd, we'd come and I'd say so much, and we'd divide amongst the guys. So there's no set rate. Okay, it's always negotiable. Because here's how I negotiate. Yeah. I know. I'll do it for all the money in my pocket. Yeah, I know. Right? It works. <laughs> I think fifty cents. No, it's a little bit more than that. A couple Looney of these yeah. 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 But anyway, and you know what? That's a good way to do it because I think you will have. You know, if you have, if you do it that way, you, uh, and you do good work, don't yeah, I don't want to hang a shingle and have one of those studios with the guys who are the martial amps. Exactly. God bless those guys that can do that. Yeah. Dennis Field up in Springfield there yeah. has a wonderful studio, and he's he's real commercial. It's open to the public, and uh, unfortunately, the virus probably hurt him too. Yeah. But he was busy for a long time. Uh, Ferguson's, yeah. It's very hard. Yeah. But I, I'm so spoiled. I don't like letting something out that's awful too. Well, and so I mean, someone that, awful that says a lot about you, though, brother. That but if someone calls me character. that's totally awful, yeah. I'll track them and all that. You know, I wish them all the best, and, but I feel bad about that because I, I'd like to uh, help them make it sound good. Sure, you know, but by the same token, yeah, it's not just about the money. Uh, we're but do the I'll, do more, too. I'll do it more on a friendship basis. Right. Yeah. But if some heavy metal guys call me and I don't know them at all, and nothing against them then i might not even be interested if that's all yep. just say go somewhere else you know that's all those some guys that can handle a martial arts and right well take your setup and play how you want right so what, what kind of style do you like to play yourself the last few years essentially i, I played almost everything yeah you know except for jazz but uh i played mostly rock mm -hmm. and rock blues and my, i have to pat richie on the back because my association with him and sam made me strong in the blues and then when i got a hold of john to play with him i didn't really have to audition it was just we're gonna practice yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah. neil robertson was there and uh i don't fancy myself a soloist uh there's there's bass playing then there's guys that solo yeah but if you separate the soloing take that completely away from a guy that dazzles you mm -hmm. is he a good bass player yep yeah. That's what I would try to pride myself on yep, sure. eventually. If you want to chuck solos to me, that's not really my thing. Yep. I'm not into showing off and slapping and all that. Yep. I'm not, it's, and there's guys that do it wonderful. They're fantastic at it. Some local yep. guys are great. Yep. But I don't think playing, you know, busy all the time is a good thing. You know, it's, uh, I agree. So, so I, I laid it down. And I played with Neil Robinson position. for years. Yeah. You could take the toms away from Neil's drum set. Yep. It's still music going. You know, he'll just play yeah. that shuffle all night. And when you're asleep at two in the morning and you wake up and you had to way too many beer, you look up. That shuffle's still going. Yeah, 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 for sure. Because he played with Minglewood for years. And those guys, they don't stop. Yeah. And that's what I aspire to be like. Well, and I, 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 I like that you're like saying that because I very much mm. have always had the team player slash accompanist kind of mentality when yeah. I played. I mean, you know, it's fun to, you know, 
want, you know, wank around and play a hundred thousand notes. And I don't begrudge anybody to do it, no. but to me, I like a band to sound like one cohesive unit mm -hmm. as opposed to, see, I get ADD really bad. And if I walk in and I hear something that it sounds like all kinds of different things going, I get a headache and, me too. and I just, it's not me. Now that's not to say that I'm right and they're wrong or whatever, but that's just, I get what you're saying. I hope that's my preference. Yeah. My buddies that are watching or will watch will laugh about this. I cannot stand Muddy Bass. Yeah. Play, okay? yeah. And someone might, some people might accuse me of being bright or something. Okay? But there's a difference between bright and clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the example of the muddy bass for me is: Would you want a cow mooing in the middle of your song all the time? Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. So the old Grand Funk Railroad, Mountain, and those early bands, they had a boom of bass. And the old bass players like Carson and those guys, you asked them, and they said that's all they played in that world, yeah. where you didn't have any tone. You just boom like crazy. We had roof sticks. I like, never, roof sticks. My favorite roof sticks. I never somewhere. want to be like that. Yeah, yeah. No never. Worries. But but what I'm saying, I'll, I'll finish my point. Uh, sure. Playing like that is equivalent to having a great band and a cow mooing in the middle of your band. Yeah, for as soon as you rip, remove that cow mooing and the bass becomes clear and good, yep. it'll do two things. It'll travel 50 feet and be clear. Yeah. And because if you're boomy here or not clear here, how did it sound for years? 50 feet out? That's all you hear. Yeah, you it know, vibrates yeah. the room. Yeah, that's all you got. Bruce, no Dixon, Bruce Dixon said, "You know what I do when I when I, when I turn my bass on? So what? He's I turn the treble off because I'm a fucking bass player." I was yeah. like, oh, that's not entirely true with him, but, but yeah, but it, it it makes sense, or that's what he that's what you're yeah. pushing. You know, because yeah. like, oh. I and I'm kind of I, I hate. But he bass, has so, so much mean. attack that Bruce is always clear. Right. Even yeah. with the, see, see, you can be deep, <laughs> and clear. Yeah. Yes. People associate deep with being muddy. It's not. Oh, you, know. you can have brand new strings. And have a dark sound and bass, yep. and really be clear. And with those beautiful PAs of today, like the Monty's PA, if the sound man's tuned in, you're good. But clink is not something that I'm. But that let you listen tomorrow. Moral Scott Brown down barely. So these 22 year old strings on this $200 bass. Sounds good. Grant through a nice amp. Yeah. Where is that? You're here tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And like we were, we went, Wayne Nicholson was playing at Monty's yeah. on Sunday, and I walked in. Uh, because we're doing a show there December 5th, and I'm gonna okay. use the house kit. Oh, yeah, and I said it's a great kit. It well, I, I sat there, and I, I looked at Dave like this, and I went up to Zach, or well, it was Bruce Nelson that was next to and I said, What is that? and he told me, and I said, I'm using, I'm gonna bring my own symbols, do not change the thing, but that, that's what I want my drums to sound like when I play. And it was just clear, and I don't typically use coated heads, no. coated heads all the way around. Dog has a great attack, too, though, his drummers go so. He was playing, and it was right. funny because I went up to him after the show and I said, "That's your wheelhouse." And I've seen him play the last little while, and, and I mean, I love Doug, man. He's a yeah. he's a great guy. He so impressed me on Sunday. He's he was a great drummer. The chops were there. He was tasty, but and, and the sound was amazing. But just you could tell that was his that yeah. was his happy place, and you he's know what a I mean. Master of that style. Okay? Yeah, no question. Of that style. No question. And you got. What, 45 years of playing with Wayne. Yep. So the two of them, you know, they, they know each other. They know each other's, you know, whatever back of their head, like they know what's yep. going on with Steve. Well, I got an idea, Andy. I think yeah. probably what we should do is come over here and jam sometime. I think that would be a really super yeah. fun thing to do. We don't want to keep yeah. you too long tonight. No, and I don't get care. stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, I first of all I want to say thanks for coming on oh, because like I think we learned about well I think we have a new secret hideout like this yeah. is, this feels like the back we're thing. not even telling anybody where we're yeah at. yeah yeah we're somewhere in Nova Scotia so far as you know that's why we're not wearing masks in here we we're a new bubble yeah. but uh, quite honestly it's like it's been a pleasure meeting you oh, and thanks, I'm hearing the stories that I don't want to hear more of but we're going to get more time and for that yeah, kind for of sure, stuff yeah. I would love to hear this place in action yeah that's oh, yeah. that's what I think it's next for us. Yeah, and here's a here's a neat little i came down here when i had a job out here right out there there's a little cove and it's really neat how right don't say cove. The, no but right across, <laughs> you can actually see mcnab's island oh, yeah. from that cove no, I know uh, that. anybody that knows me knows i'm a huge i'm terrified of sharks but i'm all there's a great white shark that pinged about 200 yards off your uh wow. off your beach yeah so wow. yeah uh, you get the shark tracker. Bruce Nelson was following those things around down at Hubbard's, man. There's, yeah, anyway, I just, I came out here and I no was No more like, oh, skinny dipping for Andy cool. Lambert, just saying. No more skinny dipping in that, whatever that cove oh, is out there. Yeah, this, this is it's the old part of here in Cove. Yeah. Oh, there's see, fish right here for years. Yeah. You know, like, and now there's, there's none left. Yeah. The last one I sold his lobster license a few years ago. So, uh, 
there's still lobster fishing going on. Yep. But of course, some someone else bought it. Someone up the road. You know what else is cool? There's U-boats sunk out past the, the cove that have been out there for, for years if you're into that thing, too. Yeah, it's pretty trench, cool, man. There's a hit, uh, a big rock head down there called La Tribune Head. Yep. And it's 1750 or 73, I believe. Unfortunately, a French ship went down there. 200 lives were lost right there, just off the cove. Yep. And there's a mass grave, which most people don't know. It's off the music topic. But on that point, they said that 200 people died and they quickly buried them there. Well. Yeah, uh, it got stuck on McNabs, and then apparently, my my statistics are probably wrong, but the, the the French commander wouldn't take wouldn't take help. Yeah, and so he got blown over here in December, and ran aground, and the ship was going like that all night. The people were in the rigging, and in the morning, a young kid named Joe Cracker rode over the dory and tried to save people. He was thirteen, and there's a memorial to him oh, wow. over there. But they said two hundred people passed. You know? Tragic. We've got a lot of friends in the states that watch the show, um, and a lot of people that want to come up here and they eat that that stuff up, like everything from you know the normal tour stuff like the Titanic, right? But stuff like that is is you know. So there you go. You get a little music, you get a little history, you get a little. You got a lot of stuff. This is what we're all about: music and history. Yeah. Live entertainment. Okay. So anyway, that's it. Uh, Andrew's yeah. going to go and do my taxes and. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to go negotiate first for some bases. Right right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Thank All right. right. Peace, Peace out, fellas. I, you know what? I never know how to shut this off. Well, there, I got right there. Yeah, that was